Let's see how this extreme value theorem and, and closed interval method work for a, a nice example. So we have this polynomial, x cubed plus 3x squared minus 9x minus 7. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum values of this function, this polynomial, on the closed interval from negative 6 to 4. And so the first step for our closed interval method very first thing we want to do is just verify, is our function continuous? Are we dealing with a closed interval? So, yeah, this function is continuous. This is a polynomial. There's no division by zero. There's no square root, negatives under square roots, or natural logs, or things like that that normally give us issues. So this is a nice polynomial, no division by zero. So our function f is a continuous polynomial so there's no jumps or breaks in the graph and we are talking about a closed interval so on the closed interval from negative 6 to 4 and we have those brackets there to indicate that we're talking about the the endpoints so the endpoints are included because we're using these square brackets all right, so that's the first thing. So the extreme value theorem, because our function is continuous and because we're looking at a closed interval, the extreme value theorem guarantees that this function is going to have an absolute max and an absolute min on that interval. doesn't tell us where to look. So that's where we start investigating the critical numbers and then the endpoints. So the next step for our closed interval method is to figure out, well, what are the critical numbers of our function? And the way we do this, this is where our derivative is either 0 or undefined. So we need, we need our derivative. Let's calculate that. Let's calculate our derivative. And this is you know, pretty standard now. So we just go through and differentiate term by term. We get 3x squared plus 6x minus 9. That's our derivative. And at this point, we've, we've been looking at how to calculate derivatives. And as soon as we're done differentiating, that's been fine. You could stop. Now we're actually doing things with our derivatives. So now we want to actually just get into the habit of trying to simplify if possible. And the way to simplify this derivative is through factoring. So this thing actually is going to factor. Um, so it might not be obvious right away, but let's factor out a 3. So we'll have x squared plus 2x minus 3, and then a 3 in front. So we just factored out a 3. And now it's a little bit easier to factor this because the leading coefficient is just a 1. So this might be a little easier to factor this way. And when we do, we get x plus 3 times x minus 1, and then we still have that 3 in front. All right, so this is our nice simplified version of our derivative. Now to find the critical numbers, we need to look at two places. We need to look for where the derivative is 0 or where the derivative does not exist. All right, so let's start with where the derivative is 0. How are we going to find this? Well, we're going to take our nice simplified derivative here, and we're going to set it equal to 0. So we take 3 times x plus 3 times x minus 1, and we're going to set that equal to 0. And then each of these variable factors here are going to give us a solution. So we set each of these variable factors to 0. So x plus 3 is equal to 0, x minus 1 equal to 0, and keep solving. And when we do that, we get x equal to negative 3 and x equal to 1. So those are our critical numbers. All right. So we found where the derivative is 0. And now we want to look, well, is our derivative undefined anywhere? And if we look at it, 3x squared plus 6x minus 9, nah, it's always defined. That's a polynomial. 
There's no division by zero. There, there's no issues like that. So for this one, there's no critical numbers where our derivative is undefined. And that's because our derivative is just a polynomial. And our function's a polynomial as well. So those are always differentiable. So there's no issue there. So the critical numbers that we found are negative 3 and 1. So we might have an absolute max or an absolute min at one of those critical numbers, but we also might have it at the endpoints of our interval. So now the next step, step three, is we're going to go through and take these critical numbers we just found, take the endpoints of our interval, and plug all of them into our original function. So when we do this, note that we're going to use the original function. At this point, we're, we're done with our derivative. The derivative we used just to get these critical numbers, and now we're kind of done with that. So when we talk about evaluating here to figure out the max and the min, we're talking about our original function. All right, so let's start with our critical numbers. We're going to plug each of those into our original function. And then we're also going to do that for our endpoints. So 4 and negative 6. So we're doing our critical numbers. And then we're also doing our endpoints. All right. So let's see what we get. Let's, let's start with an easy one, x equals 1. Let's plug that into our original function. What do we get? Well, we get 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 squared minus 9 times 1 minus 7. So again, we're plugging it into the original function. And if we do the arithmetic here, we end up with negative 12. So 1 plus 3 is 4. And then minus 9 minus 7 gives us the uh, negative 12 there. All right, what about negative 3? Let's plug that into our original function. So we get negative 3 cubed plus 3 times negative 3 squared minus 9 times negative 3 minus 7. And all right, so let's see what we get here. We get a negative 3 cubed is negative 27. Negative 3 squared is 9. And then 9 times 3 is positive 27. So these terms here just cancel out. Then we have a positive 27. And then minus 7, that gives us positive 20. And you would do something similar for 4 and negative 6. So x equals 4, plug it into the original function. We won't go through all that, but you end up with 69. Same thing with negative 6, plug it into the original function. And what do we get? Negative 61. So there we go. We... What have we done so far? First step of the closed interval method, we verify that our function is continuous on a closed interval. So we know the absolute max and the absolute min are somewhere out there. Then we start our search. So we look for the critical numbers. This is where the derivative is 0 and where the derivative is undefined. So that means we need our derivative. We simplify our derivative. And we found these critical numbers. And then. This gives us a list of x values that we need to check. So we go to our original function and we plug in our critical numbers. We plug in the endpoints of our interval. And now the final step, the last step for this closed interval method, is just to compare. So we're just going to compare these four different values here. And the largest one is going to be our absolute max. The smallest one is going to be our absolute min. So if we look, well, negative 20, negative 12, and, and 20, okay. Um, but then 69 is the largest value here. And out of all of this, negative 61 is the smallest value. So we have our absolute max, and we have our absolute min. And so then just to kind of nicely formalize our answer here, we say that our function has an absolute max, and the value of our function 
the absolute max value is 69, and this occurs at x equal to 4, the number we plugged in there that gave us the largest value. And then the absolute min value of our function was negative 61. And where did that occur? Well, that occurred at x equals negative 6. So in this example, the max, absolute max and absolute min occurred at the endpoints. It doesn't have to happen. It might happen at the critical numbers as well. So, you know, we kind of, just kind of coincidentally, both of the endpoints gave us the absolute max and absolute min, but it doesn't always have to work out like that. Now, one thing we do need to just kind of keep track of is the critical numbers we use, they actually have to be inside our interval. So just make a little note here. Only use critical numbers which are inside the interval. So in this case, our critical numbers were 1 and negative 3. Both of those are inside the interval. So if we said, if for instance we also found here x equal to 7, maybe we found that as a critical number. Well, 7 is not inside the interval, so we would have just not included that in our consideration. Yeah, it's still a critical number for the function, but it's not a critical number for the function on that closed interval. So we're only going to use the, the critical numbers that are actually inside our, our closed interval here. All right, so let's do a little more, more practice. We'll see another example. 